All right. Hello, everyone. Good day to all of you out there. For those of you that don't know me, my name is John Lustria. I'm the Director of Education at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, and I'm thrilled today to be joined by Dr. Dylan Carroll. Welcome, Dylan. Thanks for having me. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about Dylan's uh, most recent uh, book, Invisible Wounds, Mental Illness and Civil War Soldiers, which was put out, I think, just this past December. Is that right? Uh, November. November. Okay. Th this past winter. Um, yeah. So it's hot-ish off the presses. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so it's going to be, I think, a really, really engaging discussion today um, about a, a topic that uh, will probably be around as, as long as, regrettably, as long as war is around. So there's um, continual relevance and, of course, um, you know, lots of just interesting things uh, uh, on their own right. So um, I see we've got a, a number of you tuning in already. We got Carol from Plymouth, Massachusetts, Jan from Orlando, Florida. Uh, I'm here at the Museum of Civil War Medicine here in Frederick, Maryland. Dylan's all the way out in California, so we're covering the four corners um, of, of the United <laughs> States here. So, and that's one thing I always love about, uh, about our live streams is hearing where people are watching from and, and all that. So thank you so much for tuning in today. We really appreciate it. Um, if you like our videos and you enjoy this video and, and anything we do, uh, please consider hitting the like button uh, on the video, as well as following us across all our social medias, both uh, on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, wherever fine social medias are distributed, you can find us. Um, so we, we'd love to have you follow us if you don't already. And if you wanna take your support to the next level, you've really enjoyed our video programming over the last several years, consider um, donating to our uh, latest fundraising campaign. We're trying to raise money to uh, purchase some letters written by Clara Barton, which talk about her work at the Missing Soldiers Office. I'll, I'll put a link in the comments if you wanna donate to those uh, as a, a, a thank you of sorts for um, the programming that we, we offer here at the museum. Uh, there are really exciting pieces that I think will really enliven uh, our collection. So again, I'll post a link to those if you want to uh, want to help support us in that way. And we've got a, an explosion of people commenting, um, people from uh, East Tennessee, Ocean City, New Jersey, Ellicott City, uh, Bentonville, Battlefield, New Orleans, Tampa, Rochester, New York, Harpers Ferry, Maine, Connecticut, uh, Vicksburg National Military Park, Pennsylvania, Texas, Oregon, Alabama, Western PA, Colorado, uh, my goodness. Um, so people from all over, that's just, uh, it's thrilling uh, to, to hear uh, where everyone's tuning in from. So with all that said, let's go ahead and dive in to today's conversation. And Dylan, I wonder if maybe you could start us off by uh, maybe saying a few words about yourself, introduce yourself to our audience, um, and maybe how you came to the field of Civil War history in the first place. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks again for the opportunity. This is, uh, I think, my third time talking to the museum. Um, first time on Zoom. The last two times we're, we're back in the old in-person days. Um, and uh, so I'm happy to be back and uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, my name's Dylan Carroll. Uh, I am a California native. I was born and raised in Chico, California, a little college town in the Sacramento Valley, about, about two and a half hours north of the Bay Area. Um, and uh, the Civil War doesn't quite hold the valence in California as it does in, in much of the rest of the country, especially on the East Coast and especially in the South. Uh, in California, it's more gold rush history that sort of dominates um, the state history. So the Civil War wasn't really on my radar um, growing up. And it wasn't until late in college at um, California State University Chico, where I took a Civil War and Reconstruction class taught by a great instructor named Dr. Robert Tinkler. And it just blew my socks off. It blew me away. Uh, and I was just hungry to learn more about the Civil War. So I decided to apply to grad school to a master's program um, at Chico to work with Dr. Tinkler and to continue to study uh, the American Civil War. 
Um, I also wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do with my life then. So grad school seemed like a good option uh, in, the, in the intervening time. Uh, so I went on to continue to learn and, and, and read about the American Civil War. Um, I was a huge fan of uh, Dr. Stephen Barry's book, All That Makes a Man, which sort of looks at um, the experience, the emotional experience of soldiering for Confederate soldiers. And I wanted to do that, uh, even though you know no one can do what Dr. Barry does. Um, and so I uh, researched and wrote a thesis on basically the war experience of Confederate soldiers, trying to get in to what the experience of soldiering was like. Um, and it was, it was during uh, that research and writing that I was reading the published letters of a soldier, Confederate soldier from Alabama named James Williams. And um, Williams was a participant at the Battle of Shiloh in Southwest Tennessee, this really, really bloody battle, up, up to that point, the bloodiest of the war. Um, and uh, a few months or a few weeks after the battle, he wrote to his wife, um, quote, it will take me months to describe what I saw on that terrible field. He later wrote, the terrible scenes of the two days are indelibly fixed in my memory. And uh, weeks later, he wrote to his wife hinting that he was having these nightmares of the battle. He wrote, quote, I've had great and exciting times at night with my dreams since the battle. Some of them are tragedies and frighten me more than ever the fight did when I was awake. And I nearly fell out of my chair when I read that um, and thought, you know, geez, here, here's a guy who's, who's having, you know, these, these uh, frightening nightmares of the battle, which um, was, was kind of a red flag for me because I'd been reading about post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I graduated high school in 2001, you know, the same year of 9-11 of and uh, when the war on terror began. And I was, you know, closely reading about the conflicts and uh, closely reading about uh, PTSD, which was becoming, um, you know, more frequent and more discussed and talked about. And I also read Eric T. Dean's book, Shook Over Hell, which compared Civil War veterans and Vietnam veterans and argued that um, Civil War veterans had post-traumatic stress disorder. So all this stuff was on my radar um, when I read James Williams' letters where he wrote about having these nightmares. And I was um, fascinated by that, fascinated by the fact that, you know, Civil War soldiers might have been traumatized by this conflict. Um, it was interesting to me because the war is, and the war soldiers are almost always cast as these, you know, almost um, stone-like heroes who, who rushed into the din of battle, into the maelstrom of war, and never flinched, and, you know, always did their duty bravely. And it was interesting to me to sort of challenge that narrative to think of civil war soldiers you know not as these you know alabaster stone men but as real living breathing human beings um, who you know were sometimes afraid who sometimes wavered who sometimes had fears um, and that was that was really interesting to me and and, and i wanted to pursue that more uh, it was during my master's program that I got in touch with Dr. Stephen Berry, who um, uh, taught at the University of Georgia, and he graciously looked at some of my, you know, master's thesis manuscripts and gave me feedback very gently. <laughs> uh, and then after I was done, he invited me to come out to Georgia and work with him on a PhD. And so that's what I did. Um, in 2010, I uh, completely <laughs> pulled up my life and moved 2000 miles across the country to the University of Georgia and uh, uh, worked on a PhD with uh, Stephen Berry. Um, and the result eventually was Invisible Wounds. Um, I initially was gonna write a dissertation on physically and emotionally wounded Civil War soldiers. I didn't think that I could write an entire dissertation just on emotionally wounded uh, Civil War soldiers and veterans. 
Um, but as I began to write, the dissertation was kind of like Frankenstein's monster. I was loosely stitching together these pieces that didn't make much sense. And I think with a little bit of a gentle shove, Dr. Berry pushed me to just focus on the um, emotional aspect of, of soldiering on the psychological um, injuries of the war. Um, and surprisingly, I, I ended up with enough to make a dissertation and eventually a book. So um, I finished the dissertation in 2016. Uh, by then I was living in New York City with my then girlfriend, now wife. And, um, and then I spent the next several years rewriting the dissertation because it was um, virtually unreadable and uh, rewriting it into invisible wounds to make it um, readable and, and hopefully interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, there it is. And I'm sure readers everywhere thank you for that uh, heavy re revision um, to make it a little bit more digestible. Uh, so that's that's good. Hopefully. Uh, uh, I already see a, a number of folks tuning in uh, with questions and, and thank you for preemptively reminding me. If any of you have questions during the program, please drop them in the comments. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, we've got a, a good number of folks watching today, so I don't know if we'll be able to get to all of them, but we'll do our best. And uh, I actually want to uh, start off with uh, something that Anna asked that I think dovetails a little bit with part of how you came to the, the project in the first place about how we tend to think about Civil War soldiers as these, you know, uh, you know, chiseled men of stone who never flinched, et cetera. Um, Anna asks, how do you think the re-romanticization of the war in the immediate post-war years and beyond work to validate or invalidate um, soldiers who are suffering from uh, PTSD. Um, so like the, the glamorization of war, especially in like the, the reunion efforts, what role do, do we think that played? Oof, that's a good question. Yeah, we're, we're, we're starting off with a, a heavy hitter right off the bat. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, that, that's such an insightful question, and I think they're one and the same. Um, the, the romanticization of the war, you know, further isolated any veterans suffering, suffering with emotional or psychological injuries. Um, and, you know, I think it's worth saying that romanticization of the war was both a national project, but it's also somewhat natural. Um, you know, the human memory works essentially, um, psychologists argue, as a gardener. You know, if, you're, if your mind is working, uh, if it's healthy and working, it's pruning memories. And um, it's pruning memories that are useless, you don't need. Um, that's why we kind of forget things from, you know, many years ago. And sometimes people remind us and you go, I don't remember that. Um, or uh, it prunes away, you know, memories that are damaging or, or dangerous. And so naturally, many Civil War veterans, some of them, I, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was a, a Civil War veteran, gave a speech about this where he said, you know, we now, the war was terrible, but now we remember it as sort of, you know, great and and this huge, um, you know, crusade we were on. And so many veterans noted that this was a natural thing. The war was terrible in the moment, but years removed, it seemed rosy and it seemed great and romantic. Um, and there's probably a natural human inclination to, to, want, to want to remember the good times. That's right. Um, and and th there, there were, I would imagine, some good times, you know, of, of comradeship amongst people in, in the regiments and such. Yes, very good point. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, part of this is natural. People romanticize the past and even Civil War veterans sometimes romanticize their experience in the war. But certainly the national project of romanticizing the war, uh, which, which included forgetting that it was a war over slavery. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it contributed to further isolation of emotionally and psychologically damaged veterans. They were already sort of isolated because the social and cultural landscape of the time 
didn't want to face these issues um, for a number of reasons. Um, one was the psychological belief at the time was that mental illness was inheritable. So the sins of the father could literally be inherited by the sons. And so families had um, a motivation to hide mental illness within their families. They didn't want to you know, make it known that their family tree might be tainted with mental illness. So they had an incentive to hide this. Um, the most seriously you know, mentally ill would be locked up in these insane asylums uh, throughout the country. And you know you could you could literally lock them away and forget about them, and that's what much of the country did. Um, and they didn't you know always think about a mental illness in that way. So they were already isolated in this national project of romanticization, and and this personal project um, I think contributed to that. Yeah, uh, agreed. And uh, way to way to start it off, start us off. Uh, Anna with uh, with a good question. Um, again, from the comments, uh, Adam says, uh, hello from the Illinois State Military Museum. We just finished the book and we love it. So at least someone's out there. Uh, oh, reading thanks. It. <laughs> um, to the point of the book and your, your research process, this is something that uh, I know is a challenge for us here at the museum. And I'm just curious for how you approach this. Um, how did you go through looking at sources when uh, you know you're not just looking at at something like PTSD, but obviously that's going to form up a large portion of this. Um, but for all mental health issues in the 19th century, they really struggle with vocabulary and the wor the words that we use today very different than the words that they used then. So how did you go about trying to look for things that they literally could not describe? What was your process like? Yeah, um, th this is why I really liked this project um, and working on this because it was, um, you know, really interesting to think about this. Um, you know, so Civil War soldiers and, and the Civil War generation are living in a pre-Freud era. So, you know, Freud's not, um, you know, writing and thinking yet. He doesn't come around until the 1880s and 90s. And so the idea of a traumatic memory, which Freud proposes in the 1890s, you know, a memory that could be so damaging, it could result in what was then called hysteria. That idea is not around. So it just doesn't exist. Um, they don't have that idea. They don't have the toolkit available. They don't have the language. Um, so, you know, how, how, do you, how do you find this when they don't even have the language to use to describe, they don't have the ideas of say, you know, traumatic memory or, or post-traumatic stress disorder. And so it was a, a, a real fun kind of thing to noodle with and think about and write about. Um, what I did was, uh, first off, I, I tried to understand um, how the Civil War generation thought about mental illness, and I tried to unpack those thoughts and theories and beliefs. So I tried to really put themselves, put myself into their shoes and their context and, uh, and try and understand how they understood and thought about mental illness. That was fun, interesting, um, sometimes exasperating because they uh, had some really interesting ideas, sometimes contradictory ideas about mental illness. Uh, for instance, like I said, they thought mental illness was hereditary, but they also thought mental illness was curable. If it's hereditary, how can it be curable? That doesn't quite make any sense. Um, but, but nonetheless, that's how they thought about it. And then, um, you know, Having understood and being a bit conversant with 19th century, um, you know, clinical theories and thoughts about mental illness, I then sort of used what we know in the 21st century about mental illness and, and particularly PTSD to think about the past. Now, this, this doesn't mean I was diagnosing in the past. I tried to stay away from that um, uh, for the most part because we can't send a psychiatrist back in time to diagnose, obviously. So, you know, we don't know the full medical histories of these men. We don't know much about their past or we don't know their health conditions. So it's impossible to know with certainty whether any of them had PTSD or something like it. 
But it doesn't mean, I believe, that we shouldn't try, we shouldn't think about this. And so I tried to be very, very careful and precise. Um, you know, what we know about post-traumatic stress disorder, the signature symptom, what separates PTSD from anxiety or, or depression is um, a frequent and recurring invasive nightmare flashback or hallucination. So, um, you know, we think of time as linear, right? That we're on this linear space of time. That's how we experience time. PTSD is essentially a disruption of the linear experience of time. And instead time becomes circular. You're re-experiencing this moment. You can't get off of this you know, traumatic treadmill. You're stuck re-experiencing this traumatic moment, um, whether it be war, natural disaster, sexual violence, whatever. Um, and so I, I really tried to pay attention to that to, you know, if I wanted to suggest a soldier might have been traumatized or even might have had PTSD, to me, re-experiencing a moment, a nightmare, a flashback, a hallucination was necessary. You couldn't, you couldn't make that connection without that. Uh, you know, also there was soldiers who had anxiety or depression. Um, they may or may not have been traumatized by the war, but we just don't know with certainty. You know, they could have had something else. They could have had, you know, syphilis. They, you know, could have had anxiety or depression not related to the conflict. Um, we just don't know. Um, so it was about being very careful, very precise, um, and, uh, and, well, and and not trying to claim too much. Um, right. Just that, you know, here here's what soldier A, B, or C is experiencing, and you know, here's what we can and maybe necessarily cannot say uh, about right. it. Right. Exactly. Um, my, my next question sort of uh, dovetails a couple um, here in the comments. Um, Jean asks, um, you know, were, how, how were mental illnesses um, recorded by Civil War surgeons? Uh, what terms were used or were they even recorded? Um, and then Jan asks, uh, what sort of uh, common treatment either was or wasn't available to people suffering with, uh, with mental illness. So that I know there's a lot to unpack in, in those two questions, but um, let, let's start getting into, once you had sort of picked out some things, uh, at least on the patient side, let's move, I guess, to the, the doctor's side um, and see kind of how they were approaching this. Good question or questions. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, the treatment of mental illness, the theory of mental illness as, at the time was something kind of loosely called uh, moral therapy. It comes from a Frenchman uh, named Philippe Pinel and an Englishman named William Took who pioneered these kind of new um, ideas about mental illness and new treatment um, for the mentally ill respectively in France and in Britain. And it was Dorothea Dix who kind of, you know, witnessed that and brought it zealously to the United States. Uh, the idea behind it essentially was there was two major uh, causes for mental illness. One was physical. So this could be um, a, a really serious illness. Like if you had a really bad fever, they believed that could cause mental illness. It could be exposure to the elements. If you're outside too long in, in really cold weather or, or hot temperatures, it could be a blow to the head. Like you fall from your horse and hit your head very hard. Those are all physical causes they believed of mental illness. Um, the second was what they called moral causes. These were you know, a violation, what they believed of the laws of nature. They were immoral beliefs or acts. So these included alcoholism, uh, what they called intemperance. They thought that people who drank too much could drive themselves insane. Um, they believed that masturbation, too much masturbation could drive you literally insane. That was a kind of immoral uh, violation of the laws of nature, they believed. Uh, and they believed that 
sort of personal defects, too much ambition, too much greed, too much vanity uh, could also drive you insane. Um, so those are the two major beliefs. Uh, the manifestations of that were largely in what they called melancholy, which was a 19th century term for depression, essentially, um, and uh, a, a number of terms such as, you know, kind of a, kind of a choleric temperament or, or other terms that um, signified essentially anxiety or, or anger and rage. Um, and those were the kind of kind of two major diagnoses that they often found. Um, during the war, Civil War doctors and officers were not equipped uh, to deal with this. And frankly, many of them weren't interested. Um, and uh, the United States Army had to issue repeatedly um, general orders and, and circular number orders um, urging Civil War officers and doctors to deal with this appropriately. Um, in 1861 in November, the army issued a general order that any insane Civil War soldiers should be sent to St. Elizabeth's Hospital, what was then called um, the Government Hospital for the Insane in Washington, DC where they would be treated, rehabilitated, and sent back to the armed forces. But it required a whole bunch of red tape and paperwork, and most officers and many surgeons didn't want to do that, so they didn't. Um, many of them would often just discharge mentally ill Civil War soldiers um, under certificates of disability, uh, or they would find some little job for them to do, like a cook or a nurse or a laborer, where, you know, lives weren't depending on them. They didn't have any major responsibilities. Um, and uh, the Army struggled to get uh, officers and surgeons to uh, abide by the 1861 general order. Um, and uh, increasingly, you know, to 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 little levels of success, some success, but we, I don't think a, a large number of officers and surgeons were still abiding by this during the war. They started to send uh, mentally ill Civil War soldiers to um, the government hospital for the insane in DC, St. Elizabeth's, where they would be uh, treated there and hopefully sent back to the ranks. Um, Part of this, part of this reticence um, on the part of officers and surgeons was that many of them were um, suspicious of mentally ill Civil War soldiers. They thought they were faking to, to get out of service. And of course, some of them probably were, um, but not all of them. And so this contributed to their hesitance to, to send mentally ill Civil War soldiers to asylums because they, they thought many of them were just faking um, what they called shirking or malingering at the time. I wonder if you could speak also to, um, to the, the diagnoses of uh, melancholy and, uh, um, and others that you brought up um, certainly were, were quite prevalent, but I wonder if you could speak also to um, terminology like uh, uh, homesickness or nostalgia, or um, uh, John in the comments um, asked about a uh, soldier's heart as well. Um, there, there are a number of other diagnoses which uh, I believe have some degree of kind of physicality in them, but also allude to some mental afflictions. Maybe you could speak to some of those. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Uh, and, and a whole bunch of of new disciplines begin to arise out of the Civil War. Um, the historian Shauna Devine, you know, argues that the Civil War is the birth of uh, medical speciality in the United States, where doctors start to specialize in new things. One of them is Jacob DaCosta's unit looking at soldier's heart, what he called. Um, and DaCosta thought there was some sort of somatic manifestation where soldiers were having heart pain or, or irregular heartbeats, what was kind of colloquially known as soldier's heart. Um, and uh, this is kind of a, a new discipline, a new thought. Um, we, we now believe, you know, that anxiety um, 
uh, especially anxiety, does actually can have um, cardiac manifestations. It can affect your heart with, you know, chest pain or um, irregular heartbeats or things like that. Of course, they didn't know that, but uh, people like DaCosta were beginning to, you know, scratch at some truth here, um, studying this. Uh, nostalgia is another affliction. It's not um, unique to the Civil War. Um, nostalgia was identified, I think, as early as the 17th century among, among soldiers. I think it's first identified among Swiss mercenaries um, in the Thirty Years' War, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and nostalgia is essentially a 19th century term for intense homesickness. And uh, 19th century doctors literally, literally believed that homesickness could be fatal. That if a soldier had nostalgia, this intense homesickness, they could die from it. Um, and that was a, a, a legitimate medical belief of the 19th century. Uh, that becomes a serious issue, of course, in the Civil War because uh, hundreds of thousands of the three million men who become soldiers during the war, they leave their farms and hamlets sometimes for the first time ever. Um, there is no Zoom, there is no FaceTime, there are no cell phones, their only connection is letters. Um, and so many of them are insanely homesick and depressed uh, by leaving uh, their, their homes and, and farms and hamlets um, for the first time, many of them. And this, this contributes to their isolation and their depression. Um, you know, as the war goes on and gets more severe and more worse, uh, for some soldiers, it only makes that depression, that homesickness worse, um, as many of them are sort of wondering, why the hell am I here? Um, why, why did I do this? Um, uh, yeah, am I forgetting a question? Was that, a, was that the question? No, no, you, you hit on all those, and, and I'm glad that you 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 spoke to that a, a bit as well because you know in addition to these kind of trauma related uh you know mental wounds as it were uh they're being compounded by just you know the general depression of being separated from loved ones and like you said the only connection is letters um which you know for for those that are illiterate which uh is i think a minority in uh, civil war armies, but still a notable percentage, it's it's even even harder. I mean, there there are ways that illiterate soldiers send letters, uh, either dictating or 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 whatnot. Uh, but in any case, um, there's sort of a, a multiplicity of factors that can contribute to any sort of mental uh, mental health problems that civil war soldiers experience, and that's one of many reasons that makes attempting to try and diagnose from, you know, our seats here in the, the 21st century, such a challenge and, you know, in a, and an impossibility on top of that. So I yeah. wanted to underscore that. Good point. Um, question from John in the comments, which relates sort of with one of my questions. Um, he asked, uh, do we have any personal accounts of psychological trauma from uh, USCT troops during or after the war? Um, how did they process their wartime experiences during the massive socio-cultural upheavals during Reconstruction and subsequent Jim Crow era? Um, and it, it's a, a good question, which gets to, before you, we dive into that, I want to say, the, you know, the way that your book is organized, you kind of differentiate, um, you, you know, how you talk about this as it relates to Northern soldiers, Southern soldiers, uh, Northern versus Southern soldiers, and then Black versus white soldiers, um, because of course they all have, you know, somewhat different experiences. Um, so with that in mind, I wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit about the experience of mental health as it relates to uh, African-American soldiers. Yes. Um, yeah, so I, I, I separated, um, thematically African-American soldiers from, from white Northern soldiers because their experience is so different, obviously. Um, so black soldiers aren't allowed to participate in the war early on in 1861. Um, some units do um, unofficially, they're, they're not supposed to, but they do participate in some of the Western campaigns. 
um, the first Kansas, uh, an all black unit, the first and third Louisiana, an all black unit fight in some of the Western battles like Port Hudson and Malikans Bend um, and others. Uh, but it's not until 1863 that black soldiers are officially um, brought into the war as soldiers, officially allowed to you know, put on the uniform and uh, shoulder a rifle. Uh, and so that's the immediate difference. Um, and, and the differences only grow from there. Um, black soldiers, uh, first off, there's, there's much less of them. Um, there's about 200,000, roughly about 200,000 African-American soldiers who serve, which is lower than, than white soldiers. Um, and of those you know, 200,000 black soldiers, um, the United States Army didn't want to employ them as fighting men at the time. Um, and that was because of racist ideas prevalent at the time that black soldiers wouldn't stand up to combat, that they would, they would flee at the first gunshot. And so instead they were used primarily as laborers um, doing the, the hard work of building the infrastructure for the armies. Um, building camps, digging trenches, uh, fortifying garrisons, that sort of thing. Um, so not a whole lot of African-American soldiers see combat. Um, the ones that do uh, at, you know, battles like the Battle of Fort Wagner, um, uh, you know, uh, Port Hudson, Malikans Bend, their experience of combat is different as well. Um, because unlike white soldiers, uh, if they're captured, white soldiers would be treated as prisoners of war, um, you know, sent to prisoner of war camps, or early on in the war, they would be exchanged. So a Union prisoner of war would be exchanged for a Confederate prisoner of war, they'd be sent back to their, to their respective countries. That treatment is not offered to African American soldiers. The Confederacy says, um, I think in 1862 or three that any uh, African-American soldiers they capture were I would either be executed or re-enslaved or enslaved if they were free Northern African-Americans. So um, they're literally black soldiers are literally fighting for their lives in a way that white soldiers are not. Um, so all this is different. Uh, the experience is, is much different than, than white soldiers. Um, and trying to understand uh, the emotional and, and psychological fallout of the war for African-American soldiers is incredibly challenging. Uh, there are gaps and silences in the records for all 19th century Americans and, and Civil War soldiers and veterans, but they are even larger for African-Americans um, because, uh, as you said, you know, a minority of white soldiers were illiterate, but a larger number of black soldiers were illiterate. Um, of the 200,000 black soldiers, 146,000 were, were enslaved from the South who escaped and volunteered um, to fight in the armies. Some of them were, were illiterate. Uh, the army taught many of them to read and that was a, a good experience for some, but we just don't have the same amount of records for African-American soldiers to, to understand this. We have, we have you know, glimmers and hints that we can use. Um, one of the things that I found reading the letters and um, you know, looking over some of the uh, experiences of African-American soldiers is for them, um, the war of course is not perfect, uh, but it is far less ambiguous than it is for white soldiers. Even white Union soldiers, you know, the war for many of them is kind of ambiguous. They sometimes wonder, what are we fighting for? What are we doing? Um, and for, for Black soldiers, there isn't that ambiguity. Again, the war's not perfect. I don't want to say that this is a perfect experience for Black soldiers because it's not. Uh, they deal with pay discrimination. They're frustrated with um, their, their use as laborers when they wanted to be fighting men and soldiers. Um, the health outcomes of, of black soldiers are awful. Um, and uh, they, they die of disease, I, I believe in higher rates than white soldiers. 
Yeah, uh, I, I was actually just talking about our uh, about that subject with our director of research. I believe for every battlefield death uh, for black soldiers, there were uh, nine who died of disease. Uh, just uh, whereas the overall um, ratio, now this includes both black and white soldiers, but it shows you how skewed it is. Uh, Two thirds of all Civil War deaths are from dis from disease, but for uh, uh, black soldiers, it's uh, nine deaths from disease for every one battlefield death. So it's a yeah. much higher higher ratio. It's really stark. Uh, that being said, for many of the survivors, again, this is a less ambiguous conflict. Uh, they did what they and their fathers could only dream about, which is shoulder a rifle and fight their oppressors, slaveholders. Um, and they participated in the destruction of the institution of slavery. You know, again, something that their generation and their father's generation only dreamed about in, in the shadow of slave cabins, you know, away from the prying eye of their enslavers. And so um, this is a, a much less ambiguous experience for many black soldiers. Again, not perfect, um, but there's much less ambiguity. Um, so I argue that this might have, of course, we don't know for sure, but it might have contributed to lower rates of mental illness among black soldiers because the war is a war to destroy slavery. Um, it's something that they take pride in, even again, as it's not perfect and the outcomes are not good. That however, is not the full story. Um, there were likely many African-American veterans who were mentally ill that we just never hear from because they're are all these um, other factors that contribute to this sort of silence um, of mental illness among African-American soldiers and veterans. Um, one is, as some historians like David Silkenat have argued, in the post-war Black community, there's this pressure to be successful. Um, you know, African-Americans in the post-Civil War, especially South, they know that white Southerners are looking at them in now this new emancipation world. And they're gonna try and find incidents of African-American soldiers, uh, veterans and African-Americans failing or becoming mentally ill. And then white Southerners would say, oh, look, see, freedom was bad for you. We shouldn't have done this. Emancipation was a mistake. So there was pressure in the black community to be successful. Now we don't know this for sure, but, but Silkenat suggests, and I agree, that many um, potentially mentally ill African-American veterans might have suffered in silence because there was this pressure to be successful and they didn't want to be examples of the failure of emancipation in the eyes of white Southerners. Another reason, um, there simply wasn't access. Uh, most insane asylums did not give access to African-American patients. And if they did, they did in the post-war years grudgingly and in very small numbers. Um, St. Elizabeth's, the government hospital for the insane, did offer access to African-American uh, patients and veterans, uh, but in much smaller numbers than for white patients and for white veterans. Uh, the first uh, insane asylum that opened to specifically treat uh, black patients was Howard's Grove in 1869. Um, in Virginia. Uh, that's the first and only uh, insane asylum designed to treat explicitly um, African-American patients. And so they just don't have the access. And so um, there, again, there could have been many mentally ill African-American patients and veterans that we just don't hear of because they don't get access to an asylum. On top of that, <laughs> uh, and you're seeing this is very complicated, on top of that, um, African-American patients who might have gotten access to an asylum perhaps might have not wanted to because medicine at the time was, was frankly pretty racist. And um, African-American patients might have been hesitant to put themselves under the treatment of a doctor who might have had racist views. And especially if they were former slaves, former slaves understood when, when they were enslaved, they understood doctors as the agents of slaveholders. And they were, they were suspicious of, of doctors and suspicious of medicine. And at the time, um, you know, in the post-war United States, many mental health practitioners believed 
that emancipation could cause mental illness. They said this outright. And so it's understandable if a maybe African-American suffering with mental illness would be hesitant to put himself under the care of a doctor who was saying emancipation caused mental illness. This was a mistake. Uh, on top of that, <laughs> there's the issue of pay. Uh, most insane asylums are, uh, many, the private insane asylums are pay institutions. You pay to get treatment. Um, St. Elizabeth's, the government hospital for the insane is a bit different because in 1866, Congress passes a law that any uh, Civil War veteran who could demonstrate symptoms of mental illness um, uh, manifested within three years of their discharge could get free or subsidized treatment at the institution. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, if you wanted to go to a pay institution, um, African Americans were uh, much poorer than the average white Southerner, not through any fault of their own, but because of, you know, discrimination and segregation. Um, Larry Logue looked at African American veterans in Rhode Island and found that um, African American veterans in Rhode Island uh, were, you know, four times as likely to be in poverty than white white veterans. They were five times as likely to be in poverty than even black civilians. Um, so, you know, they're, they're they're very impoverished, and even if they could perhaps get access, and even if they wanted to, there's the issue of pay that stands in the way of many of them. Um, so there's tons of silences in the records that, that prevent us, you know, knowing with absolute certainty what happened here. Um, and, and I try to deal with many of these issues. Uh, in Saint Elizabeth, that being said, in St. Elizabeth's, I did find African-American veterans who were patients there and, and looked at some of them. Um, from 1861 to 1890, uh, nearly 50 uh, Black Civil War soldiers and veterans became patients at the hospital. Uh, that was a much lower number than white soldiers and veterans. Nearly 3,000 white soldiers and veterans became patients at St. Elizabeth's, while, while just under 50 Black soldiers and veterans became patients. So it's a huge disparity in numbers at St. Elizabeth's um, for all the reasons that I, that I just laid out, I argue. There's certainly uh, certainly a lot there, and I think that gives folks, uh, you know, at least a taste of, uh, you know, some of the, the the stuff you cover in the book. Because of course, um, you know, you have separate chapters on uh, white northern and and white southern soldiers as well. Um, so there, there's a lot there. Um, we're coming towards the end of our time, and I know there's uh, a few other folks uh, with with questions here. I wondered. Um, Let's quickly, we'll, we'll tackle maybe a couple of these here. Um, Lynn asks, were uh, asylums uh, overcrowded and underserved in ways that might be comparable to say POW camps? Uh, I mean, certainly not that, not, not that sort of intense deprivation um, obviously, but, but in terms of how resources were allocated and what the experience of being there might be like. Uh, in short, yes, uh, uh, asylums were overcrowded and underfunded, um, not to the extent of POW camps, you know, like um, Camp uh, Andersonville, uh, Camp Douglas in the north, you know, these were really horrid and wretched experiences where, where you know, many people essentially died of disease or even starved to death. They're, they're not on that level, um, but they are quite, they become very overcrowded. Um, for instance, in, in the 1870s, there was a congressional investigation of St. Elizabeth's. Um, uh, it, it started when Democrats retook Congress in 1874, and they started basically attacking Republican institutions, one of which was the asylum, St. Elizabeth's, where they brought charges against the asylum superintendent there to try and humiliate him. Uh, but during the investigation, they found that the asylum, which had something like 500 beds, uh, was serving 750 patients. So um, it was way overcrowded and way underfunded. Um, and this was 
largely the case. I haven't studied every asylum, so I don't know with absolute certainty. But I suspect that most asylums were like this, overcrowded and underfunded. Um, and they quickly became filled with the chronically mentally ill, um, those who were uncurable, uh, and they quickly became filled with dementia-related patients, the elderly who were suffering, suffering with dementia and um, age-related dementia. And uh, so they kind of became warehouses for you know, the, the chronically mentally ill and, and age-related dementia patients. Uh, and there was, there was never enough funding or construction to keep up with demand. Um, sadly, I, I, think this, I think this is, um, well, I mean, uh, it's interesting to me, but I suspect that the book might be depressing to some people. Um, but I think one of the depressing parts of this book is how little has changed. Um, you know, mental illness and, and its treatment it has throughout American history been underfunded. Um, you know, we know this is an issue, but we just don't want to, uh, you know, pay for it and do the work to try and effectively deal with it, which, you know, I'm not, I'm not judging anyone. I understand that no one wants higher taxes, um, but, you know, we, we have to spend money if we want to deal with, with some of these issues effectively. And, you know, this has been a theme in American history uh, in the asylum period, uh, which at the time was considered the most enlightened kind of treatment of the mentally ill. Even then, they weren't, um, they weren't funding them enough. Yeah, and I, I often like to end our, uh, our interviews here uh, by asking authors, because I think writing a book is such a Herculean and... Um, <laughs> Uh, it's certainly a Herculean task and, and in many ways a, a personal task as well um, by, by asking uh, authors, you know, what their hope is for the book. You know, what do you want people to, to walk away with? And I think, and I'll, I'll let you speak to that, but I mean, I certainly, I certainly think what you were just laying out there is pretty compelling, um, you know, to learn from the past and, you know, let that motivate you to try and you know, do something positive in the present. Um, but uh, feel free to, to speak to that question about what your hope is for the book. Yeah, to your point about a Herculean task, very much so. Uh, when I started grad school in 2010 at Georgia, I like to read acknowledgments in many books. And, you know, so you spend a lot of time reading books and I'd read a lot of acknowledgments. And a lot of them were, you know, this was a 10 year project. This was a nine year project, you know, and I would always kind of scoff and say, hey, you suckers, it's not going to take me that long. You know, and then, of course, I started grad school in 2010 and the book came out in 2021. So it took me 11 years. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, it, it was a, a long road. Um, and uh, so God, that's a good question. Uh, kind of what I was alluding to earlier, I hope that people come away from the book understanding that Civil War soldiers were human, that they weren't these granite um men of stone who, you know, unflinchingly rushed into the maelstrom of combat, um, that they were human, that, that some of them struggled with this, that, that, you know, some of them were broken by this experience. Um, you know, I hope that people also take away some of the context uh, that, of course, you know, um, history changes over time and to kind of look at the evolution of mental illness and, and how the Civil War played a part in the evolution of, um, you know, medicine and psychiatry. Uh, I hope people take away um, that, you know, racism and discrimination um, is, is quite old in American history, and it, it also affected, you know, some of our nation's heroes, Civil War veterans who you know, gave their, their health, sometimes their lives on the altar of freedom. And uh, black defenders of the Republic, you know, suffered in ways that, that white defenders did not. Um, and uh, what else? Um, yeah, and I, and I, and I, I just hope that um, people enjoy it. Um, uh, I, I worked hard, like I said earlier, to, to try and make this book readable and enjoyable. Um, so I hope people enjoy the, 
the information, the analysis, but also some of the stories, which I think is, you know, the, the flesh and blood of history is, um, is, you know, looking at people's lives and, and historians are essentially interested in people, um, mostly people long dead. Um, but, but we're interested in people and their stories nonetheless. So yeah, um, I hope people enjoy the book and, and, and find it worth their time. Absolutely. Um, and again, uh, I'm sure people will, will appreciate all the work you, you put in, you put into, to that, the, uh, the 11 year process. I, I, I also enjoy, uh, reading acknowledgments, um, because I, I know how meaningful, you know, writing something that gargantuan is, and it's, it's fun to hear people get to, uh, be relieved that it's over. <laughs> yeah. Um, it and, was very uh, fun to write the acknowledgments too. Because I'd, I I'd, I'd read so many. I bet um, it was. Um, well, we, we have a few uh, folks in the comments. Uh, Suzanne saying that uh, she's already ordered the book. Great presentation. This is a dear spot to me as uh, my dad suffered from PTSD from World War II. Thank you. Um, and um, someone else mentions they're ordering it as well. So um, anyway, got a got a few orders uh, for you as, as a result of this. So that's nice. Thanks for those comments. Oh, yeah. I, I that that that's been really interesting and touching for me because I've you know given some talks uh, throughout the years about this, and I've had sometimes you know veterans from Vietnam come up to me and say you know thanks for thanks for telling this story and giving this a voice because I had PTSD from Vietnam and. And it's it's important to get this out there. So um, that's been really touching and something I didn't expect when I wrote you know a book like this, a pretty niche topic in in the American Civil War. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been uh, uh, really rewarding and touching, kind of hearing some of that stuff. So thanks. Absolutely. Um, so thank you all of you for tuning in today. We really appreciate you joining us. Um, if you enjoyed uh, the video, go ahead and hit the like button, share it with your friends, send it to someone you think might enjoy it. And to stay up to date with what we're up to, uh, follow us wherever um, you get your social medias, uh, whether it's here on Facebook, over on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, uh, we're, we're all over the place. So um, make sure you follow us to be up to date with the latest that's coming. And if you want to take your support to the next level, consider um, giving to our, our Barton Letter Fund, our latest fundraising campaign, uh, trying to purchase some letters written by Clara Barton to expand the collection and continue telling uh, exciting stories about the missing soldier's office. So thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you, Dylan, for being with us today. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I appreciate the opportunity and thanks everyone as well for tuning in. Um, I appreciate it. So until next time, this is John and Dylan signing off.